Hey, so this morning we are uh, changing it up again, and we're going to have our courageous storyteller, Aaron Wright, come forward. Uh, Aaron is going to share with us this morning of a story of loss and what it's like to continue in a story in the midst of such loss. Take a seat, Aaron. Uh, for those of you that may not know Aaron, her and Stuart and their family lost their 21-year-old daughter, Maddie, uh, just over a year ago, unexpectedly, mm-hmm. and yeah. Aaron's going to share with us about that loss. And by the way, if you were at all fuzzy on what courage looks like, this is it. This, this is courage. This is a very courageous act, so I thank you for being here, Aaron. You're welcome. Um, our daughter, Madison, uh, when she was a junior in high school, we were having a lot of problems, and... Uh, we needed to do something. We felt like we were losing her. She needed help. We, need, we needed help. So we sent her to a therapy rehabilitation school in Utah. While she was there, she turned 18 and easily could have walked out. But fortunately, she did not. And she stayed and finished the program. And we picked her up right before Christmas. Um, she finished high school. She got a job at Kohl's. She enrolled in Community College of Denver. She bought herself a car. Life was good. And I'm not saying it was perfect. There were a lot of ups and downs still. But she was living life and loving it. In uh, July of 2013, we were in Montana for orientation with our youngest daughter. And when we returned home, we found that Maddie had passed away. We originally thought it was alcohol poisoning, but she had fallen asleep in a bad position and cut off her airway, and she passed away from positional asphyxia. And so our, our family was pretty torn apart. Yeah, and, and tell us, Erin, um, what are some of the, um, we've talked almost every week about uh, these things happen in our story, and what does it look like to uh, continue in our story, even when it's not at all what we expected. Um, what are some of the things that have l- allowed you to go on? And let me preface it with this. Uh, why I asked her to be here isn't, isn't just to spill out her pain and then go home, but it's actually because uh, when we were in watching Erin, she uh, she's participating in life. She shows up and she's part of this community. She sings in the choir. And uh, that's not always easy to do. So share with us the things that help you continue. That is not easy to do, but um, I was bound and determined to not be the mom that checked out. I could not do that to my husband and my other girls. I couldn't do that to my family. Um, So through the support of this church, um, this amazing church that has been there from the day that they found out and continues to support us, up until now, I thank you. My choir family, and they are definitely my family, my disciple family, our wonderful clergy and staff, so many friends and family, I thank you. Because I don't know if I could have done it without you. But most of all, I get my strength from God. He gets me through each and every day. Reminds me to stop and smell the roses and to be a little kinder to myself and to help others. When uh, the first year, I made it through the first year. I have to admit, I think the second year is a bit harder because she really isn't coming home. Um, I know God was with her when she passed. I know he comforted her. And I know he took her home to heaven, and I find great comfort in that. So, so we go on. Um, Valentine's Day, I found, I walked upstairs and found this card in her doorway. It was her Locks for Love donation card. And um, she loved to donate her hair. She had this long, thick hair. And out of one donation, she can make three donations out of one ponytail. So she loved that. Um, I think that was her way of telling me that she still loves me, and I love her. 
and to go on and live life and be in relationship with God because he's always there. And um, I miss her horribly, but I pick up the pieces and all of you help me pick up the pieces. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Our stories are more meaningful when we do them with God and with one another. There was a first century Jewish rabbi named Jesus, and he told a story this way. A certain man had two sons, and the younger son approached the father and said, Dad, give me my share of the inheritance, which, by the way, is not a very good way to approach your father, <laughs> or anyone for that matter, because what he essentially said was, Dad, I wish you were dead. You're worth nothing more to me than the money I can get out of you. And so the father reluctantly, or maybe not so reluctantly, gives in to this belligerent request. And soon enough, the son takes, the younger son takes this inheritance and he goes off to this foreign land, this distant land. And he lives a very extravagant lifestyle. And he blows it. He blows it all. And things get so bad that we're told he is working as a hired hand to feed the pigs. And at one point, he even longs to have the food the same food that is filling the bellies of the pigs. And so he comes up with this brilliant idea. Maybe I should go back home, back to dad's. Even if I have to work as a servant, maybe it would be better there. And so that's exactly what he does. He starts making his way home. And like every other night for the last several months, the father is standing at the window waiting for his son's arrival. And on this night... That's exactly what he sees. So the father opens the door and runs out to greet him with hugs and kisses. It is a really interesting image for this first century Jewish story because he runs. And a first century Jewish patriarch would never be caught running. Why? Because it's an act of shame. As he would run, his robe would start to come up, even if it was just a little bit. And as the robe came up, his legs would be exposed. This was shameful. This is something you turned away from. These are not the elements that make for a good story. And so they go on to celebrate. And he says to his servants, Quick, fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because the son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found and they continue to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son has been working in the fields all day and he's making his way home. And as he makes his way home, he hears this laughter and loud music. And as he gets closer, he asks one of the servants, what is going on here? And the servant says, with amazing excitement, he says, you're not going to believe it. Your brother has come home. And your dad is throwing this huge party. And it's not just for us or the family. It's for the entire village. The older brother is absolutely furious. His dad begs him to come in and join the party, and he says no. He stands outside, and finally his father comes out, and he says to him, Look, Dad, I've served you all these years, and I never disobeyed your instruction, yet you've never given me as much as a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And he says, But this younger son of yours, can't even refer to him as his brother, this younger son of yours comes home, and after doing what he did and you do this, you throw him a party with the fattened calf, which, by the way, if you wanted to have a feast with your family, you would certainly bring out the lamb. But to bring out the fattened calf, this would feed an entire village. If you do this, and the father looks at him and says, Son, you are always with me. Everything that I have is yours. 
And in this moment, you can hear that reconciling music come in in the background as if we're at the movies, and, and the camera is panning out. And the older son gets a smile on his face, and he puts his hands on his hips, and he says, Oh, shucks, Dad. I've been so arrogant. I just never saw it this way, and I'm glad you let me see it this way. Let's go in and celebrate. Where's my younger brother? Actually, that's not how the story ends, right? <laughs> it ends with, Dad, you never even gave me a goat so I could party with my friends. Son, you are always with me. Everything that I have is yours. It's left very unresolved. Does he join the party? Or does he stay out? It's left unresolved, and maybe that's why it's such a timeless story in our culture. Maybe it's why it's a story that we keep coming back to. Because all of us have been to a party where there's a brother missing. Something is left unresolved in our lives. Maybe it's that broken relationship, the one you tried so hard to make work. And for whatever reason, it just couldn't be reconciled. Or maybe it's that friend you look at and say, man, I wish he could see what a downward spiral, spiral he's in. Why won't he get help? Why won't he just admit how bad things are and get help? Or maybe it's that broken dream that somewhere along the way, everything you thought that would happen just kind of fell through the cracks, and when it did, your dreams fell with it. We've all had, and we all have, unresolved things in our story. But I want to focus for a moment on the bigger story that's going on here. You see, this story is told in Luke chapter 15. And the opening of Luke chapter 15 tells us exactly who the audience is. It opens in these two verses, all the tax collectors and sin sinners were gathering around Jesus. These were probably people who were new to the Jesus movement. They were get, and they were trying to make sense of his teachings. And the Pharisees and the legal experts, so the uh, religious leaders of the day, were grumbling, saying, this man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. You see, I think it's Jesus' way, the story of the prodigal son. Jesus was saying to them and to us, I know you thought God was this way, but let me invite you to see God in a new way. You thought God was about exclusion and condemnation, but this is the God who welcomes you even after you've eaten with the pigs. It's another interesting image in the story. A good first century Jew would never be caught eating among the pigs and certainly wouldn't desire what pigs are eating. This is the unclean animal the forbidden food of pork. But this God welcomes you even then, and this God takes reconciliation seriously because it's not just about being reconciled to an individual, but sometimes you need to be reconciled to an entire village. And see, you thought God was this way. You thought God cared more about rules and regulations. But this, this is the God who runs to you. This is the God who exposes his legs, who puts love above shame. You see, good stories, they're the stories that we can actually find ourselves in. Good stories are those stories where you and me say, huh, that's me. When it comes to the story of the prodigal son, how many of you, at some point in your story, could identify with the younger son or the younger brother? You were given so much, and you blew it. And you know that blowing it was actually because of your own doing. It had nothing to do with anyone else. But because of this, you also know the power of forgiveness. You realize the depths of forgiveness and reconciliation. And you also realize that sometimes the consequences of your actions mean that you need to be reconciled not just to an individual, but to an entire community. 
And because of this thing, you also realize the power of partying with a community because these are the ones who love you. These are the ones who will welcome you home. These are the ones who will sustain you when your story is toughest. How many of you along the way have identified with the older son or the older brother? You said, no, I'm not going in. And God, if you knew what I knew, if you knew what she was really like, you wouldn't be offering this type of forgiveness. Or you say to the boss, look, if you knew what he was really doing, if you knew what his story really was, you wouldn't be giving him this promotion. You wouldn't be giving him this pay raise. So I will stand outside in silent protest in the most passive, aggressive, unhealthy way to show of my disapproval. But maybe somewhere even in that moment, you hear God saying to you, yes, and even you, you are always with me. Even you in this moment, everything that I have is yours. Because you realize in this moment or a moment after that grace isn't just for the unclean who realize they're unclean, but it's also just as much for the unclean who think that they are clean. How many of you could identify at some point in the story with the Father? Because you know exactly what it's like to wait. Because for countless nights, you have sat at the window beside the front door, blinds open, waiting for your boy to come home. I haven't been there yet, but I'm not naive enough to think it couldn't be me. It's just that my kids are four and one and a half, so I have time. But I did, I can recall, numerous nights watching my mom at the window beside the front door with the blinds open, waiting for her boy to come home. And here's the thing, he always came home. I knew he dragged his butt through the door and I knew in that moment, mom was going to welcome him. She was gonna throw open the door, run out to the end of the driveway and greet him with hugs and kisses and some sort of celebration. And I just couldn't understand it. Every piece of my being wanted to protest and say, Ma, if you only knew where he was and what he was doing, you wouldn't be giving him this sort of welcome. Well, life has a funny way of shaping your story. Because as I've grown older and as I've had kids of my own, I realize that Mom knew exactly what was going on. And she still chose love and she was still filled with compassion. You see, good stories are those unresolved ones, the ones that cause us to ask the deepest questions, the deepest things that we know. What kind of stories are we living? Are we experiencing deep forgiveness and deep reconciliation? Are we offering that to others? Are we welcoming those who we don't think should be welcomed? Are we standing outside of the party or are we joining the celebration? It's unresolved stories. And we live good stories when we teach and lead people that the world and their story isn't just about them, but it's about a God whose message is to love a broken world. One of my favorite things about this series over the past few weeks was hearing your all stories. I would get emails or face-to-face -face conversations or Facebook messages of you all saying the good stories that you were living. Some of the emails started with, I'm living a good story, and then you would tell me what you're doing. One lady told me she was uh, finally taking the plunge to join the Peace Corps, and she's headed to Thailand here in a few weeks. You know, when I preached on uh, prison ministry a couple of weeks ago, I received emails and face-to-face -face from you all. Some of you said, hey, I dig that. I want to be with those people and in that way. That's something God's calling me to. You know, one of my favorite moments was after one of the services a couple of weeks ago. 
someone came up to me and said, I'm living a good story. And opened the hand and put what was in her hand in my hand. It was a 30-day sobriety chip. And I thought, this is exactly what it means to live a good story. So here in a moment, we're going to hear a song. Uh, Three of you texted or emailed me this song throughout the last five weeks. It's a song by Stephen Curtis Chapman, uh, Glorious Unfolding. And you said, man, this song just fits with what you're doing. We've got to play this song. So we saved it for last. As the song plays, you'll notice seven what-if stations. Like last week, I invite you to move around this week. We do this in storyline. We'll just kind of dream big together. We'll put the person in the middle and say, what if you did this or what if you did this? And the person could say, yeah, what if I did this? What if I went to Guatemala? But this is your opportunity to dream big. You might say, well, what if we? What if it's a community thing? Things like, what if I went on a mission trip? Or what if the group that I'm a part of, what if we gave up an afternoon each week and served the least of these? Or this person in my life who just has called strife. What if I actually took the steps to reconcile with this person? Or what if I started a blog or wrote a book about this thing in my story? Because some of you have had stirrings, not just over the last five weeks, but over the last few months or years. And some of you just need to get that out to live better stories. And there's just something about writing that on the walls of a church, isn't there? But we recognize, and what if there's no limits? There's no boundaries. There are no censors. But the other beauty is we write these things in pencil because there's also something beautiful about pencils and erasers in this world. You are not bound to these things. Feel free to dream. So as the song is playing, I invite you to move to one of these stations and write, in a brief phrase, few words, a sentence, what if I, or what if we? If you are one of those people who says, no, I don't want to move, I like sitting, I want to reflect, I invite you to stay seated and reflect and watch the video. It's a pretty moving story. I invite you to move, or I invite you to stay seated. Thank you.